first and foremost, this topic of emotional intelligence, again, we may have heard this term, but I do I think it's important to define it. So let's give a little bit of history first. Back in 1990, there were two psychologists named John Mayer and Peter Salovey, and they introduced the term emotional intelligence into the community, into the community of mental health. And so this challenged the way we, we understood intelligence, right? This concept of what is this other form of intelligence. Prior to that, it had always been measured through IQ, right? And so Daniel Goleman comes along a few years later, sees their work, and is like, this is pretty powerful stuff. He writes about it, and he writes this book. So he's considered the pioneer of this, of this whole concept. And he writes this book called Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than IQ. It instantly becomes a New York Times bestseller, 5 million copies sold, printed in 40 languages. So it's a pretty big deal because... Again, it's revolutionary according to these, uh, these uh, you know, people in the field. Now, what exactly is it? It refers to the ability to first identify and manage one's own emotions as well as the emotions of others. So it's a pretty simplistic definition, and there's a lot more to it, but it is important to understand why this is so relevant for us as Muslims, and I'll get to that in a moment. But this uh, idea that emotions actually precede thoughts, right? It's, it's something that we should know because it does explain why sometimes we don't think rationally through things because we're in heightened states of emotions uh, and those things take over us. And so our rational mind takes a back seat. And that's why it is so critical to have this ability to regulate your emotions because a lot of horrible things happen when people do not regulate their emotions or, or can't regulate the emotions of other people, right? And we have clearly seen many examples of that even through this past year and a half, right? People becoming almost unhinged, right? At the beginning of COVID, you remember what happened when, when uh, we would go to uh, you know, Costco or some other store to get basic supplies and it's all running out because people are just out of control almost, right? Fear, right? Fear sets in. And so we're seeing a lot of that, unfortunately, unfold in different ways. But this idea of how can I control myself and how can I be useful when controlling other people's emotions is something, again, very, very um, central to our faith. And so we wanted to explore that today. Now, just a little bit more context here. Um, the skills that you acquire being emotionally intelligent, it, this acronym is pretty helpful. So remember, it. Um, first, you become emotionally aware, right? So this is, again, the ability to name and identify emotions. Then you can regulate, so that A, R, right? The ability to harness those emotions and apply them to tasks like thinking, problem solving. This can apply in your personal lives, at home, when a problem arises, at, in a professional setting, in a, in a community setting like this. What, well, how do you respond, right? And then managing. So the ability to manage emotions. So that arm, okay, is what you want to think about when you think of emotional intelligence. That am I... Is my arm, are my arms strong, right? Do I have strong arms, right? Can I, am I aware, can I regulate, and can I manage? And so just remember that. And then this is also important because it, again, ties into the whole talk. When I learned about uh, Daniel Goldman's work and started looking more into what the community uh, was, was responding to, how they were responding to his work, this quote really caught my eye. A revolutionary, paradigm-shattering idea. I mean, that's a pretty powerful quote to give to anything, right? This is the Harvard Business Review. That's a pretty solid you know, review, right? And then they also heavily encouraged people to read Daniel Goleman's work called What Makes a Leader. So they're letting us know that this concept of emotional intelligence is quite, you know, again, paradigm shattering. It's, it's so revolutionary. And it indicates the qualities of strong leadership. So you can see where we're going with this, right? Um, the fact that, again, people not that long ago, relatively speaking, were so impressed by this idea of being emotionally intelligent and identifying that these are core qualities of leadership was something that I just became aware of. And then, so this is the question we have to ask, right? If this framework is considered so revolutionary, so paradigm shattering, then, right, it has to be useful, and it's useful in, the, in identifying the qualities of an effective leader, then it must have some merit for us, right, as Muslims, Right? We should explore this concept. And the answer is absolutely yes. And so 
this hadith, I, I actually just learned of this hadith very recently when uh, Sheikh Hamza pointed this hadith out to me. We were talking about emotional intelligence and how, you know, this was so paradigm shattering. And I was just sharing this stuff with him. And he said, this is, you know, this is the Prophet of Islam, his teachings. And he actually already spoke about how emotional intelligence is more important than any other form of intelligence in this hadith. So when I looked it up and I, I just was mesmerized, right? Right? SubhanAllah, here we go. Right? The basis of reasoning, so intelligence, he's tying intelligence with what? After the faith in Allah. Like that's, you know, if you're an intelligent person if you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And after that, how is your intelligence measured? In loving kindness towards people. You cannot be, you, you can't, you know, pride yourself on intelligence if you are devoid of this is what he's saying, right? If you want to be measured as an intelligent person of aql, you first believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then you know how to basically be with other people in, in that prophetic, beautiful way. 1400 plus years ago, he's telling us this is emotional intelligence matters, right? And here, fast forward, how many centuries later, paradigm, you know, <laughs> shatter it, right? It's just amazing, subhanAllah. So, why, uh, you know, I, I decided to explore this topic further because as I was reading the qualities of emotional intelligence, it literally was like, this is the, they are describing our Prophet Every single quality, they are describing him. He has taught us this. It's in our deen. It's in the Quran. It's in the Sirah. You can find example after example. We need to start teaching our youth this because let's be frank, we live in a time where unfortunately, this is just the, 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 the time that we live in, a lot of our community members are more impressed by modern frameworks, right? They find this stuff dazzling and they'll eat it up. Whereas if you were to teach them a course on the Sira and let's look at the Prophet you know, beautiful virtues, okay. But this will get them. So this is why I feel that it's incredibly useful to learn this as uh, mashallah, uh, uh, Brother Hassan mentioned, right? This is useful for us in every relationship. If you're married, it will be absolutely useful for you in your marriage. If you have children, if you're, again, in a, you're taking care of your elderly parents, whoever, whatever relationships you have, if you can master this concept of emotional intelligence, you will become essentially a better person, a better human being that's able to cope with a lot of what life presents you. And so what I appreciated too about it is the structure it offers you. The very first quality of emotional intelligence is self-awareness, okay? So um, let's look at what that means, okay? And there's quite a few different ways we can look at this. But the first thing that came to mind when I heard this definition of what self-awareness is, right? The realization of oneself as an individual entity or personality is the popular maxim in Islam man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabbahu, right? It's in the transliterations up here so anybody can read it, which means what? The one who knows him or herself knows their Lord. So this is a, a maxim. It's, it's uh, oftentimes misquoted as a hadith. It's not, uh, according to many scholars, it's not a hadith. It's just a quote that many of our ulama have you know, used to emphasize the importance of becoming self-aware, right? And then when we look at the Prophet's life itself, he can you just looking at his life even before prophecy, right? How more self-aware could a person be than to remove himself from his community, go to the cave, right? Why was he going there? What was he doing there? He did not want to be a part of the toxic elements of his society. He couldn't handle it. It was too much for him. So he pres he knew what he needed. He needed that retreat. This is before prophecy. So he paid attention to what was going on within him, and he listened to that, and he honored it, and he, he was able to you know, self-soothe in his own way. So his uh, self-awareness is immense. And of course, throughout his life, you find example after example of that. Here's this hadith, and remember, in order to be self-aware, you have to start with that pursuit of knowledge, right? You can't just all of a sudden wake up and, and suddenly think that you'll, you'll understand everything. You have to explore, you have to ask questions, like the way that the Quran asks us to, right? Even in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us those questions 
so that we are self-reflective. One of my favorite verses is right? Think about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking us to ask ourselves, where are you going? Right? Do you even know? How did you? And then that should make you ask, where did I come from? Because that, you know, just that thought process gets you exploring. So knowledge is the, you know, is one of, is the principle to this. You have to, you know, be in pursuit of knowledge. And in this hadith, the Prophet says to us, oh, people, knowledge only comes by learning and understanding only comes by seeking understanding. So niya, intentionality, all of these words that we may have heard, this is how we begin the pursuit of becoming more self-aware. For whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intends good, he gives him or her understanding of the religion. Verily, only those with knowledge hear Allah among his servants. So self-awareness is, is, is built upon this pursuit of knowledge, right? And then the Prophet of course tells us, right? I was sent as a teacher, so he is, of course, teaching us this knowledge and he is relaying it to us, but all of the, our self-discovery starts in this pursuit, right? Then knowing your value. This is also one of my favorite hadith. Right, the Prophet ﷺ was witnessed by the Sahaba in uh, you know the Haram, and he's walking around looking at the Kaaba, and he says, "How pure you are! How pure is your fragrance! How great you are! And how great is your sanctity by the One in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad? The sanctity of the believer is greater to Allah than your sanctity in His wealth, His life, and to assume nothing of Him but good." such an affirming hadith this we should all internalize that our souls our being our existence when we believe in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we follow his commands is more sacred more sanctified than the kaaba itself and how many of us see the kaaba and we're like just imagining the kaaba right and so bring that back to yourself to know you were built with value allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave each and every one of us value by the mere fact that we are in existence all of this is the beginning part of this process of becoming self-aware. Then, you know, we go into knowing more depth, right? You have to know the foundations of your faith. If you don't know your aqidah, like what does it, what is the creed of a Muslim? What do Muslims believe, right? We know the six articles, but we have to penetrate deeper. What is, who, who is our creator? Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because in the absence of no, true knowledge, then you will be affected by people's view of God, right? And there's a lot of messages that people have, a lot of new age concepts, a lot of things that are floating around in online and in, in social circles and media and songs about who God is, you know? And so a lot of Muslims, when they don't know their aqidah, they don't know the attributes of Allah, they start to assume things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then that affects their understanding of the world. Why did God make this and that? And they start questioning who? Who are we to question the Creator? He is, this is all His. This is entirely His. And just, and it's amazing how double, this double standards human beings have because this is my property. And if someone tells me what to do with it, I take great offense, right? You shouldn't put your phone here. You shouldn't have put it in this case. Why do you dress this way? Why do you dress that way? When we are questioned, in our personhood, in our material possessions, we take great offense, even for the parents in the room. If someone sees how you are as a parent and corrects your parenting style, how offended do you become, right? You better watch out <laughs> because most people don't take well to being corrected that way, right? So we have a lot of double standards as human beings because we think, take great offense, but then subhanAllah we turn around and we ask Allah why? Why, why are you allowing COVID to spread? Why did this person have to die? Why did, it's not for Allah. We are nobody to question our creator. His decree, we accept it. And that's where it ends, right? But if you don't know that and you don't have that education, then unfortunately you're gonna be affected by all the negative messages that are out everywhere else. So you have to know your creed. Then you have to know what your responsibilities are to Allah. What is what does he expect of you? Why did he create you? What for? Just so you can eat and drink and you know, go on YouTube and watch random videos all day? That's why he created you? No, he created you to worship him. That is literally the only point of your existence is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything else is from his fadl, from his generosity, from his rahmah that he gives us relationships and beautiful people in our life. He gives us delicious food, right? Think of all that, the, the, the drinks that we eat and the 
clothing and all the beautiful adornments of this life are just added, but the purpose of our existence is, of course, to worship him. We have to know that. Then you have to know your temperament. All of us are different. There are people here who are what we would refer to as introverted temperaments, right? They're not the type of people that like loud noises. You know, I'm sure a few minutes ago when it got rowdy, all the introverts are like, where are the parents? <laughs> you know, <laughs> send them in there and get their kids under control, right? Now, the extroverts might not be affected that much because extroverts like sounds, they like lights, they like, you know, they, like, they get excited, they're excitable by stimuli. This you should know about yourself because I'll tell you, it can absolutely affect the way you are with other people, especially if you're a parent. I once did a whole talk on temperaments and afterwards this mother came to me and she said, oh my God, she was crying. She said, I wish I learned this. I never knew this difference. And I had two sons. One was extroverted. Now she got the language. The other was introverted. And I spent my whole, their whole life measuring one against the other. Because in this society, extroverted people are celebrated, right? Extroverted people are hailed as the example. Oh, they're so outgoing. They're so, uh, they can go speak. They can go do this. They can go do that. So all the introverts feel like, oh. I guess I'm nothing. I have no good qualities. And you start to feel depressed and down. No, it's not for a lot. When you study Mizad, you study temperament, and you study that the Prophet said him, he was the most perfectly balanced of all human beings. And he had all four temperaments. When you study the theory of temperaments, it gives you definitions, it gives you meanings, and that he was in perfect balance. And our goal should be like him, not you know this celebrity or this famous person. Forget that. We don't measure ourselves to, to the people around us. We measure ourselves to him. So he, just by, again, knowing that science, it can be very affirming. So you know that. You know other things, too, that are helpful. Love languages, right? This is self-awareness. Every single person in this room should know what your love language is. And if you don't know what that even means, I, I have something to help you. So the five love languages. Okay, This is uh, Gary Chapman. He wrote on what? How people give and receive love. Everybody's different. And I can't tell you, I've worked with many couples this is usually the root problem of why so much miscommunication. Because one is loving a certain way and receiving a certain way, the other is a different way. And they're just, it's like, you know, trying to get a PC to communicate with a Mac and there's just, iOS's are different and there's nothing <laughs> right happening. But once you start to get well read in love languages, it starts making sense. For example, if your love language is the first one, which is words of affirmation, you like compliments. You need someone to acknowledge you when you do something for them, like, thank you. May Allah bless you, make God for you. Just show you with words, okay? What, and, and even beyond that, maybe you like to receive cards on your birthday or love letters. If you're married and your spouse is thinking of you, it makes a big difference, right? Uh, text messages, emails. That is your love language. Tell your, your spouse, I need you to compliment me, to make me feel better about myself. Um, if your love language is not that, but acts of service matter, maybe you're juggling, you are doing so much, you work full time, you're taking care of this, you're taking care of that, and you just need help. You need someone to come and say, I got this, you don't worry about this. Then your love language is acts of service. Gifts, maybe you like to receive and give gifts. Maybe you feel so loved when someone goes out of their way to buy you something or make you something. It doesn't even have to be something to purchase, right? So you have to know what your love language is. Quality time. If you don't even need any of those things, you just want someone to sit right next to you. And I know people like this. In fact, I told my husband I think this is his love language because he could be zoned out, you know, reading, doing his own thing. But as long as I'm in the periphery and he can see me, that's good enough. <laughs> Very, you know, we don't have to have too many interactions, but he likes that that I'm there. I'm not out somewhere else. So if some, for some people, this could be their love language. And then the last one is physical touch. So if you're affectionate, if you do feel more bonded to your children, to your spouse, uh, to your, the people in your life, your siblings, with this, that's your love language. So communicate that, but first become self-aware because if you're not, it can really hinder your relationships. And I've seen this play out, but this is just one tiny piece of the puzzle of every single one of us. So we can see how long this topic of self-awareness can go, right? You can keep going. And so this is uh, from uh, Surah the Shams, right? Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, What is this? This is putting the onus back on us, right? That we, to become self-aware, you have to start paying attention to yourself and seeing what you're taking in, what you're consuming, whether it's good for you, whether it's not, right? If you're purifying yourself, you're working on yourself, that's also part of 
really having an accurate image of who you are. And so this is essential, again, to, uh, to, to your, uh, your, your spiritual health, your spiritual well-being, is to, to have this type of awareness, right? And the onus is on us. Who, and he who, has, who has, he has failed, who instills it with corruption. What's it? The soul. If you're, in, if you're putting in all that evil, then you're going to be held accountable. Know that. Know, you know, take accountability. So that's just the first quality of emotional intelligence. And there's so much more to talk about. But, you know, strengths, weaknesses, talents, potential. Uh, and then all of those other things that, you know, in terms of emotions, needs, there's a lot when, it, when we talk about self-awareness. So that's the first topic. Then we get into self-regulation. Again, I want you to connect the dots with how much this is central to our being, because we're, we covered all those things that are foundational principles of our being. Know yourself, know all those things. Now we move into control yourself, right? A big part of our being is Tzitzkiyat the Nuts, right? Which is the ability to purify our soul. We just read the verse, right? And how do we do this? We look at the diseases of the heart, the spiritual diseases, the diseases of the tongue, and we start to regulate. We start to literally control ourselves. This is why fasting is also essential. Fasting isn't just about food and water. We know this. We've heard many khutbahs uh, and lectures on this topic, but it all puts it all back in this uh, you know, umbrella term of regulation. Allah subhanahu wa expects us to work on control. We're supposed to practice abstinence of, in many different ways and forms so that we can control those, uh, you know, those things, those impulses that if we don't control them, they can be weaponized very early, very easily, right? So if we're not, uh, you know, controlling our food intake, we're not controlling the words that we say nowadays, a huge problem for the youth in this room, pay attention to it because it's very normalized, is cursing as if it's no big deal, right? You see all these people dropping F-bombs and saying horrible words. This is now their language. It's just the way they speak because they cannot control themselves. They don't, they've lost comportment, they lost the etiquette of being in public spaces. Usually, uh, you know, if you had, for example, someone call you on the phone and there was a, maybe some tension, people would get up and go to a private place. You see that happening anymore? Right in the restaurant, on the bus, wherever you are in public, they're now fighting. They don't care. They don't care that you're there to listen to them. Because the, the whole, you know, social, again, etiquette's out the door, but it's, there's no control. And then, you know, there's so many other iterations of that. And that's just with language. But what about the food that people eat and the other behaviors that they're doing? A lot of it is indicative of what a total loss of control in, in their body and their actions and their words, right? And here we are called constantly. Karbiya, what is the process of karbiya? What are we all as parents and teachers, as educators, community members, so focused on, on raising our children, right? With tarbiya. What is tarbiya? It's to instill in them these values of, you know, control yourself, regulate yourself, right? And so we have this concept, mujahid and nafs, struggle. And it is a lifelong, until we take our last breath, we are in a struggle against ourselves. And it's really important to get that because, um, you know, if I ask you now, for example, what is the greatest enemy of the human being? What's the answer? Shaitan. I heard Shaitan. What is the greatest enemy of the human being? Yes. Your nafs. Right? We have to have that clear. It is Shaitan is Adu al Mubin. He's clear, right? But the greatest enemy, according to our scholars, is the nafs. It's that voice within you. So if you externalize your threats, this is now a huge blind spot you have, right? You, you, you're too trusting of yourself. And so you think, and how many times has this happened to you? Zohar comes in, you're reminded to pray. Oh, I'll pray in a few minutes, right? You trusted who? Yourself. And yourself is, the nafs is lazy, it's indulgent, it doesn't want to do anything that requires work. So it's going to come and distract you and say, you know, later, later, later. So that's why procrastination is a sign of what a, a, a nafs that, that has been, that's under attack. So we should know these things because mujahid and nafs is, is a, a, like I said, a lifelong problem. All of this falls under this umbrella term of self-regulation. So much of our being, the Prophet direct teachings when he, when he teaches us about emotional regulation specifically, 
La tahda, right? When the man came to the Prophet and asked him, and he said to him, do not become angry. Now, let's unpack that because sometimes there's uh, confusion here. Anger is a human emotion. We all feel angry for different reasons, but there are certain reasons where it's justified. We should be angry for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What the Prophet is saying really in that hadith is do not become anger, right? Don't let anger lord over you, take over you, where you lose yourself and you're not even visible anymore. So when he saw the man who became very angry, he said that he looked like, you know, he was red in the face, he looked like a shaitan. And that's what happens when people lose their cool, they say, right? Um, and then that can lead to so many other horrible things. Crimes of passion are from a person usually who has no control, but based on some heightened emotional state, they, they lose it and then God, you know, they do terrible things. So that's one direct command. And then the other one is la darara wa la which is do not harm, right? And do not reciprocate harm. So don't be a person who's out there harming people, whether it's with your words, your actions, your intentions. Be a good person that puts good energy out there. And don't ever let your nafs justify harming for the sake of, your, you know, out of spite. People are very vindictive now, very vengeful, very spiteful. And they don't see that that's a total lack of control and a lack of, and a weakness in faith. Because if an injustice happens to you, you have to go back to your aqidah, right? And know that no injustices are lost in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all debts will be collected with God at some point. So I don't need to take matters into my own hands and go and exact my own justice and try to get, you know, my, my you know, uh, what do they call it? Just desserts, as they say. I don't need to do that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has full knowledge, and whether I'm in the right or the other person's in the right or whatever the case may be, in his court, it will all be squared away. So I let go of the need to go and retaliate. But this is not taught in this culture and society. You see a lot of, you know, terrible things that people do out of relationships, divorces. I mean, I have a family who are attorney, and they say the ugliest sides of a human being comes out in, in a divorce. Like you will see evil beyond your wildest imagination. Total lack of control, right? And a very weak faith when you think that you need to punish someone for what they did to you. Leave them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trust me, you will never do uh, yourself justice by taking justice into your own hands because his justice will always be superior, right? So just be aware of that. So all of these are teachings that we are taught in, in terms of self-regulation. Motivation. Our entire, again, existence is right here in chapter 51, verse 56. And I did not create the jinn and mankind except to worship me, right? That's it. No other reason for us. And then, the, and then beyond that, we are motivated with what? Messages of this beautiful, I mean, Amal ibn Yat is, is one of, I mean, it's a very, uh, again, one of the first hadith people learn. But this is central to our belief because it really should uh, be something, I mean, when we teach our children, or even for ourselves, just to constantly judge our actions, not on the outcome, because it's never really going to be good enough. We'll always be short somewhere, right? We're distracted. Our intentions, maybe this or that. I mean, our, our thoughts, maybe this or that. But our intentions, if they're pure, we should take a great solace in this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is judging our intentions, right? And that's what matters the most. And then looking at how the Prophet said him, I mean, there's nobody in any other faith tradition or historical figure that there is a, in recorded history with as much detail about their life as the Prophet said him. We know everything he did, right? And this was witnessed by countless people that, you know, these are confirmed things, that he woke up and he had routines. So this is where, alhamdulillah, we should be so grateful if you've ever had a negative thought about your prayers, make toba because your prayers are an incredible gift that align you with a sense of purpose. As someone, I'm not in, uh, you know, I'm not a mental health expert by any means. I'm an advocate, but I can tell you from many of the people I've spoken to, one of the crises of our time is that there's, a, you know, a lot of people who don't have a sense of purpose. They're walking around aimless. Because nobody told them they were important, nobody gave them any value. You have a lot of, you know, nihilism, a lot of just cynicism, a lot of atheism, 
that is everywhere. And so what it is is it's the byproduct is a, a whole you know generation of people who think that they don't have any value whatsoever in their life. And here, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us not only value by telling us why he created us, but every minute of our day he said to measure it and to put value in it, to be mindful of, of him, right? To do constant remembrance of Allah. And then he spread out these prayers so that we can do it without really much, uh, if you think about it, it's it's so simplified for us. Because had he told us to do five prayers and they weren't spread out because of our own nature, we're, we're such, we're our own worst enemies, guaranteed some of us would have this mindset of like, okay, let me get them all done in the beginning of the day so that I can just go have the rest of the day to do whatever I want to do, right? That would be the nefsi response. I'll just get the duty out of the way so then I can, like homework, right? How many kids... I have kids, yeah, I'm a teacher. There are some kids that are like that. Let me just get it all done really fast so that I can go play for the rest of the day. That's our nature. But he knows that that would harm us tremendously because we would be more open to sinning. We would be more forgetful. We would fall into ghafla. We would harm ourselves and maybe harm other people. So he spread those five prayers out so that we protect ourselves from ourselves. So be grateful for that and be grateful for the schedule of, of a believer because we should be scheduled people. And that's why looking at the Prophet I said at every point of his day, he had a dua. Every point of his day, he had a, something to remind us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of that is to motivate us, to get us to be self-motivated individuals so they're not we're not walking around aimless, right? And then in addition to that, I love, I mean, these are such powerful hadith we should take solace in. Uh, the Prophet I said, said, whoever comes to his carpet intending to stand for prayer at night, Yet his eyes are overcome with sleep until morning. His intention is recorded for him. And his sleep is charity for him with his Lord Almighty. Allahu Akbar, how generous is our Lord. Just from the niya. So make niya every night that you wake up for the hajjah. Make it. Ya Allah, please wake me up. Because guess what? Just by having that intention, even if you don't and you're so exhausted because you didn't, you know, whatever the case may be, SubhanAllah, he rewards you with the reward of, of doing the hajj. This is our Lord. And then if a servant falls ill or travels, the likes of what he used to do when he was settled and healthy will be recorded for him. Again, Allahu Akbar. That's, I mean, this is all to, to keep us motivated. That your Lord is generous. Don't let, you know, don't fall into despair. Don't start to, you know, measure yourself with impossible standards. Just do your best and know that intentions matter, right? And then this last one, again, such a beautiful hadith, the Prophet uh, uh, this was reported by Usama bin Zayd, he said, the Prophet sent us on an expedition. In the morning we attacked Al-Huraqat al-Juhayna. I caught hold of a man and he said, there is no God but Allah, but I stabbed him. So this is in the middle of battle, right? He, he stabbed this guy. Then it occurred to me that I should mention that to the Prophet and now his guilty conscience, right? So the Prophet said, did, did, did this man that you killed actually say that there is no God but Allah and then you killed him? And he said, O Messenger of Allah, um, he only said it fearing the weapon. Like he said it just because I had this weapon over him. That's why he said it. And look at the beautiful answer that the Prophet tells him. Did you tear open his heart to know if he meant it or not? Right? So this is a good reminder for all of us not to assume anyone else's intentions because the outward reality doesn't always match the inward, right? So it's humbling, and it's to check us, right? Work on having pure intentions, be motivated, and don't fall into this habit of looking at other people and presuming anything about anybody because you don't know. You don't know what's in their hearts. That's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of this are, these are powerful reminders to keep us, again, in that third quality of motivation. Then we get into empathy, fourth out of five, so two more. The entire life of the Prophet Islam, you will find so many beautiful examples of his empathy towards the, the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Um, here, I mean, one of the most, again, uh, foundational hadith is that you hatta yuhibbu ma yuhibbu nafsi. Right? You have not completed, right? You will not complete per the perfection of your faith until you love for your brother or sister what you love for yourself. So that right there, to empathize to that degree that you even want them to have, you know, more, better than you, right? Or the same as you at least. And then we move into actual examples, right? The Prophet said, when he would do jama'ah prayer, we know this, if he heard a 
a child crying or wailing, he would shorten his prayer. And the beauty of this hadith is it wasn't just for the rahmah towards the child, it was for the mother. Because mothers know, right, it's very hard when our children are crying. We want so desperately to break the prayer to tend to them. Uh, we're worried about them. Or if they run off, God forbid, it's panic sets in, right? So out of his mercy, he is teaching all of us to empathize with the experience of another person, to not be so self-involved because you love your own firah that you're going to do surah al-Baqarah, right? When a child is, is crying, don't do that. Shorten the prayer. Be mindful. Pay attention to your congregants, right? Um, and then when Abu Jahl, this is also a powerful example. Abu Jahl, you know, he was killed in Badr. So his son, Ikrama, wanted to speak to the Prophet Sallallahu And uh, when the Sahaba, you know, were, were kind of vetting this out, the Prophet warned them. He said, listen, his father just got killed. Do not refer to him as the son of Abu Jahl. They don't refer to his father as Abu Jahl. Have empathy because his father just died. Even though this was a great enemy and he did so much against the Muslims and against the Prophet but even towards him and his son, he's showing empathy. So we, how do we uh, receive people that we don't like, right? There's within family, no, I mean, this is an extreme case, but there's people who will lack basic empathy with someone they just don't like even in their family. So these are reminders for us. You know, is it this, to, to this degree uh, that you don't like someone? It's not, ever. So practice empathy, follow the Prophet's example. And then he forbade us talking secretly, right? If I speak a language that someone else speaks and someone is around us, we don't speak in that language. That's it. Adab. Or, uh, you know, just like come, come a little closer and you, you alienate someone else. If there's multiple people, that's different. Now you're, you know, this is a private conversation between two people, you're okay with that. We're speaking about specifically in, you know, numbers of, of three or, or what have you, don't do that because it's going to hurt the other person, even if you're not speaking about them at all, it doesn't matter. All of this is to teach us adab. And then uh, here, um, a man came to the Prophet and he said, I've come to make, uh, to make you a pledge that will do um, hijrah, although I've left my parents in tears, right? So he wanted to come with the Prophet while his parents were in this state, and what did the Prophet tell him? Go back to them, right? And make them laugh as you made them cry. So he did not, even though he wanted to make hijrah with the Prophet he's teaching him, empathize with your parents. Don't just uh, you know, abandon them, neglect them, it's, you know, prioritize them. So countless other examples, but th this is the fourth quality of emotional intelligence. So if you don't have empathy, you have to really think about this, like, I need to start increasing my empathy because this is a quality of the Prophet said, it's a hallmark quality. If you, I mean, he, he, he empathized with the palm tree, he empathized with uh, animals, with the bird, with the camel, so many countless examples. Um, the woman who came to him, right, there was a woman who was known to have mental health issues and he was sitting in his jama'ah, she came and interrupted that circle and he received her so beautifully. She was kind of in a hysterical moment, you know, broke his, his, his having a gathering, and she said, I need to speak to you. And how did he receive her? So beautifully. You pick any street in Medina, and I will come and sit with you. He honored her so that she doesn't feel bad or, you know, nobody else can say anything to her. And then he sat with her, and she basically unburdened whatever was in her heart. That is our Prophet said, empathizing always with people, the poor, how many poor did he help? I mean, there are just so many examples. So when we see a deficiency of these qualities in ourselves, we have to go back to the drawing board and say, I need to work on this. I can't just be like, oh, this is who I am. No, it should bother you. That's Mujahid al-Nafs, that it's not good enough unless it's like, or at least trying to be like the Prophet And until I'm there, I'm not gonna accept it. That's what the struggle is, right? And then we get into the last quality of emotional intelligence, which, which is social skills. And this is also critical. Now, a lot of us, because of COVID, this may have dipped, right? We're, we're not seeing each other, so it's a little bit awkward, you know? Even now, I mean, I'm the only one who's showing her face. It's kind of weird, right? But, <laughs> but this is, you know, uh, we have to really revisit our social skills here because uh, we're seeing through the roof in COVID and even prior to that, but especially in COVID, 
social anxiety has gone up a lot. A lot of people are just feeling so, there's just so much trepidation, so much fear. There's just a lot of anxiety in our world. So alhamdulillah, we go back to our deen and we, we remember, just recalibrate. Like what, what, what is my responsibility as a Muslim to my fellow believers, my fellow you know, brothers and sisters in faith, and my fellow brothers and sisters in humanity? How should I engage with them? How should I connect with them, right? And so here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, clears it all up uh, in Surah Al-Hajarat, verse 13. O mankind, indeed, we have created you from male and female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. So we should be open. So when we see each other, um, you know, we have to open conversations, at least the salam, you know, do the afshah salam abaynakum, spread the peace, smile. I mean, now with the mask, it's hard unless you get those masks that have... <laughs> You know, a big smile on your face. Um, those are funny, by the way. Or your own people who make their own faces. That's like, I don't know if you've seen those. I've actually seen those. Uh, they're kind of scary, actually. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, but smiling, it's its essential. So if you're not a smiley person, work on it. Do better. <laughs> like, really. You know, you have to because it's a sunnah of the Prophet. He smiled even when he was heartbroken. He would push beyond that because he wanted to welcome people and make them feel good and make them feel special. Why? Because he preferred other people over himself. So if you're having a bad day at work, you're just not feeling good, fake it. You know, do it. Because the idea you get by forcing that smile, you we have no way of measuring it. But it's far greater than being, you know, like pouty and negative energy or just rude and mean. So we have to do better in terms of our energy towards one another, right? And then here the Prophet is now getting very specific. The Muslim is a brother to another Muslim or sister. He does not wrong him nor surrender him. Whoever fulfills the needs of his brother, Allah will fulfill his needs. Whoever relieves a Muslim from distress, Allah will relieve him from distress on the day of the resurrection. And covering faults, so important. People don't do this anymore. They're quick to unveil everybody. Now with cancel culture, it's like, you know, no big deal. Oh, did you hear about so-and-so? Oh, no, what happened? And stuff below, like the grapevine is so active because people are busybodies. We've lost, you know, sense of what's important, and we just want to spread gossip. Cover the faults of people. This is part of a right that we have on one another. So if you see someone, you know, out and about doing something that you consider a little shady, don't come and pick up the phone and go, oh, my God, you know, guess what? Guess who I saw getting in a car with you? You would know what me. Stuff from Allah, we should just be like, I didn't see it. Leave them to Allah and ask Allah to veil you because guess what? There may be a time in your life where you're doing something or somehow you're unveiled and you beg Allah to veil you. Like, please don't let anybody know this, you know? I'm so ashamed of myself. So don't be that type of person that's quick to unveil people. This is all part of our developing those interpersonal skills, those social skills that we need. And then do not hate each other. I mean, now it's like, subhanAllah, the fact that it's, I mean, I don't know, I just feel sometimes shame on us that we have to have such very specific, you know, uh, uh, things just, just laid out for us. Don't hate each other because he knows that we can be filled with these emotions when we don't have what? Self-regulation. We're not working on tasqiyah, and so we allow our emotions to get the best of us. And now you see people saying to each other, I hate you. You know, stuff from all. In the one household, you'll see people saying this to each other. Spouses say it to each other. Children saying it to parents, parents saying it to children. It's just a mess, right? The word hate is very strong. I, I taught my kids very early, don't say hate for anybody, but who? Who can you say it for? Shaitan. That's someone who deserves your hatred, right? But to say, I hate this and I hate that, it's charged words. We should be better at the language that we teach our children and what we accept for ourselves. So don't use that word so quickly, right? Don't hate each other, don't envy each other, because hasad is another problem. With social media now, most of the people who are on it are there just inviting hasad into their heart. They're not there to, uh, you know, champion a cause or spread good wor words, you know, they're not there for that. They want to see who's doing what where, who's wearing what how. They're just there to, you know, spy, to cry, and then what does that do to the heart? It just invites all this hasad. Why did she get that? And why did he get that? Ooh, I wish I had that. I hear it all the time. Literally, I hear this from people. One sister once reached out to me. She's like, I don't know what to do. 
um, uh, my sister-in-law has a social media presence and every time I see her stuff, I just feel so much hassle for her. And my answer was, why do you watch her social media? Like, don't watch her social media. What are you doing? If you know that you have hassle for her, why are you allowing that, right? But we have to be reminded, don't do that, right? And then if you have a dispute, I mean, we're human beings, things happen. Three days, that's your limit. Work it out. So that is the Prophet system directly telling you, work on your skills, regulate your emotions, do what you need to do in those three days. Do not pass that limit, right? All of these are to help us, help ourselves. Because if we don't have this type of instruction, then what? Our greatest enemy, our nafs, will take over and we justify, we justify all of our behavior. Oh, they deserve it. She shouldn't have done this. She shouldn't have done that. He shouldn't have done this. And we allow the worst of our nature to come forward. When the message that we're always told is, this is dunya, this is dar al this is a place, it's a low place. Don't sink in it. Rise above, right? Rise above it. This isn't our final abode. This is an ephemeral world. It's fleeting. We have, we're going to a better place, inshallah, after all this is said and done. Don't sink with the dunya. So rise above, be a greater person, be the greater person, right? And then here, these are the last two reminders that we should really, really, again, think about when it comes to our own behavior. The believer who mixes with the people and endures their harm um, has a greater reward than one who does not mix with people nor endures their harm. Why is this relevant? Because, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to meet people in your life you have no choice. They're your family, you're married into them. Maybe they're your in-laws, maybe they're your cousins, maybe they're someone in your family you have to deal with them. You cannot run away from them. If you take the modern idea about these things, which is like, I don't have time for that, and I'm canceling people, and I'm cutting people off, and I'll never go to their house again, you know, good for you. I mean, if you're proud of yourself with that, but look at this hadith. This is not saying, by the way, and we want to clarify that to be a target for abuse, okay? We draw the line at abuse. But if someone, an elder, for example, is just a little nitpicky, maybe they're not very nice, maybe they're flat out sometimes rude, or someone in your family, not necessarily elders, sometimes youth can be the same. But you, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sake of keeping your spouse happy, for the sake of keeping the family bond happy, right? You subject yourself to being uh, enduring them. Okay, fine, let's just go to their home. I don't want to be here, right? But I'm going to be here because I, the family bond is important and I don't want to be a person who causes fitna. Then remember, you're going to be in, rewarded for that. Just you sitting there and enduring their, you know, sometimes you have family who tell you the same story like a you know, hundred times, you know, and if you're internally going, oh no, here we go again, but you're still sitting there, yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, and you're doing the whole act. You get immense reward for that because you don't have to. You could be rude and be like, I have to go. I don't have time for this. You already told me 10 million times. You could do that. But you're not. You have adab. This is adab. It's basic adab. So take a, a, you know, pleasure in the fact that Allah Subhanahu is witnessing you fighting your nuts for his sake. You just do it. Okay? And then the Prophet said, like, this is also... For anybody who feels like people walk all over you and take advantage of your niceness, there's a lot of very good people who are like, uh, you know, feeling just like uh, oppressed, you know, in their situations. And they may very well be oppressed, but this is also an incredibly powerful reminder where he tells us whoever is kind, affable, and easygoing, then what? The fire is forbidden for from touching you. So just be like, alhamdulillah, I'm not that angry, mean person, always oh, giving me an easygoing temperament. If that's what it takes to be away from the fire, I will accept it, right? Alhamdulillah. And just, again, find solace in that. And so, you know, th these are all, again, there's so many reminders, but alhamdulillah, this, this framework of emotional intelligence, I highly encourage all of us to look into it more and to really structure our understanding of our practice as Muslims according to it, because it does make things it makes easy it makes things easy and it makes sense right because each one builds upon the other if i am a self-aware person i know my purpose i know who allah is i know all those things then i can control my behavior right because i have you know a, a clarity about my own nature right i can start to regulate myself and if i'm doing that enough i'm going to find this rhythm which is where the motivation comes right 
that motivation to just pick up every day to just keep going because I have a greater purpose, the intentionality of our existence, all of it is clear for us. We know why we're here, we know what we're supposed to do, the formula is very clear. So it gives us a sense of this drive, right? And then from that, we inculcate empathy towards other people because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala softens our hearts. We start to see and understand people have different natures and we start to appreciate the differences in others, right? Reflecting our own differences in them, right? This is the al-mu'min, uh, uh, add to al-mu'min, right? The believer is a, a mirror for the believer. So you start to see, oh, you know, my temperament is this way, so that person's this way, so let me just be more empathic. Let me be more gentle. I lower my expectations. I don't, I'm not so rigid. And then from there, your social skills improve. You just become easier to be around because the more prophetic like we are, the more welcoming, open, compassionate, merciful, people will gravitate towards us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is when we prioritize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we follow our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa all of that tawfiq will come to us. The doors will begin to open in our relationships, in our professional lives. All of these things will happen because we're, we're pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before we're, we're uh, thinking about his creation, right? So always prefer that. And it's, it's just a formula that works, right? And so quickly, uh, because I know we're a little over, but I wanted to leave you with this last slide so that you can check yourself to see where you fall in the spectrum of emotional intelligence. If you're doing any of these behaviors on the left side, I'm sorry, but you need to work on your emotional intelligence, okay? If you argue a lot, you're argumentative, you just want to pick fights 24-7 or all day if you could, whether it's online or with your family, with your children, with your spouse, you just pick up the phone and you're just arguing, okay? Or you like to just argue politics and this person and that person, just, okay? And then the hadith on the right are just reminders for us. But insensitivity, if you walk by someone crying and weeping and your attitude is like, get over it. That's for the law. You know, we have to do better because that's not the Prophet's way. Right? Um, when he when we when he found Umair crying over his bird that, that died, the Prophet didn't say, get over it, tough it up, Umair. So what? It's just a bird. No, he showed him compassion and he you know he was playful with him in a way where he he wanted him to know i understand your pain that was our promise so be sensitive towards people when they're going through things if you're a stoic person and this is where temperament also makes a difference some temperaments are stoic so you have an advantage you you're you're, you're thick skin but maybe not everybody that you know so in sibling households you might have someone who's very strong and then their sibling isn't but there's usually this dynamic where the stronger one is always picking on the little one. So teach your children not to do that. Be sensitive because the Prophet said I'm most sensitive to people, right? Um, Self-righteous. If you went to Hajj 10 times and you've been wearing the hijab since you were, you know, a, a newborn, okay? Some people are like, they take it to that level and your beard is beautiful and long and you, you, you know, you do all the sunnahs, you put puhala, you do it all. Don't ever get ahead of yourself and judge other people. Don't be the religious authority that walks around judging how, oh, why are you praying this way? You should do this. You should do this stuff. Don't be self-righteous because just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided you, he can take the guidance away from you. And the quickest way to do that is to become arrogant and self-righteous. So always remember, right, that it's from Allah that I am this way. It's not because I did anything to, this, to be this way. It's from literally Allah. He can take it away. Displeasure with blame. If someone is correcting you and your nafs starts to boil up and you really don't like it and you retaliate and you snap back and you cut them down because you can't stand that they corrected you, you lack emotional intelligence because everybody uh, makes mistakes, right? Everybody makes mistakes. Right? So all of us make mistakes. Um, and the best of those who make mistakes are those who recognize their mistake because in order to make Toba, you recognize your mistakes, right? So be open to, uh, to being called out and to being corrected. Poor coping skills. If something happens and you fall apart, we need to go back to the drawing board. You have to study, you know, what is this world? What is this life? What's the temporality of this life? How, you know, the design of the world, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, what is justice, uh, death, you know, grief, whatever it is that made you fall apart, 
you need to revisit it so you have a sound understanding, right? That this isn't it. This is just a, a part of the journey of the human being. We're travelers, right? Um, so work on our coping skills in terms of how to process things that we're not happy with. And then emotional outbursts, if you have, you know, you get riled up very quickly, easily, um, and you can't help yourself, you know, this is also a sign. With the exception, and I will mention this because I write about this as well, we also have to factor in hormonal, you know, influences here because they are true. Some people are actually impacted by hormones and they can find themselves being more agit agitated or irritable and, and, you know, a little bit more snippy during certain times of the, uh, especially for women, in the case of women with menstru menstrual cycle. So this is a valid reality. It's medically proven, it, it exists. So we need to be sensitive to also those things, but still work on ourselves. And then abusive and toxic relationships. If you have a history of having really negative relationships, you wanna go back and say, am I the common denominator? Am I bringing attention to that type of, you know, am I inviting that type of energy into my life? Why? And work through that, you know? But all of these are just good indicators for us to see where we need to work on so that we become more emotionally intelligent, more aligned with the Global Solar Systems example, inshallah, and, you know, build those skills that will help us deal with all the stuff that we're dealing with right now. Like a lot of this COVID and quarantine and just everything that's happening financially and politically, it's rattling so many people because they haven't done this internal process of really getting clarity about their beliefs you know, who they are, what their relationship is with the world. Like, all those things matter. And that's why we should be using our time really wisely as we are still in this lockdown. You, you know, if you're watching, again, videos and Netflix and just wasting a lot of time on entertainment to cope and to escape from all of it, you're doing yourself a disservice. Use this time to read, to study, to become a better person. So that when you emerge, you're like, you know what, alhamdulillah, I got a windfall of time. You know, uh, many of us are working from home, whereas even I was, you know, my husband, for example, he, he works in the tech field. Before, his schedule was hours, literally on a bus, two hours there, two hours back. Four hours on a bus, lost every day, having to work, you know, crammed in this tight space, and then out of the house for how many hours based on his schedule. So now, alhamdulillah, he's home. We're able to pray as a family together eat our meals together. What a gift from Allah. So if you're in that situation, see it as an immense ni'mah, but use the time wisely to learn, to read the Quran, to improve on your prayers, to strengthen your relationships with, you, with one another, right? And inshallah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, you know, takes us out of this situation, you will have used that time wisely. But if you just grope, I mean, uh, gripe and, and uh, complain, and you're negative, it's a waste. So, alhamdulillah, jazakumullah khairan. Forgive me, I know I went over by a few minutes, but if there are any questions or comments, Brother Hassan, mashallah, again, this is a subject that he is very familiar with. Thank you for being so patient to um, to sit here throughout this. Uh, you could have, I'm sure, um, given the same talk, but I would love to hear from from anybody uh, who has maybe some, some thoughts to share. Is there any slideshow I think it's recorded, right? No, it's, it, it, it doesn't project well. Oh, okay. So I have this exact, like these talks already on YouTube. If you go to uh, YouTube and just do emotional intelligence with my name, you'll see talks that I've done on this topic. So all the slides are right there. Yes? Thank you. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on, um, I guess, uh, the old theory of that? Thoughts perceive emotions, and you mentioned earlier on that it's actually emotions that perceive thoughts. Yes. For me, that's kind of new ish. You know, so I, if you could just speak to this, you sure. have some more things to talk about. Very uh, great question. So, this idea that what comes first, our thoughts or our emotions, right? So, if you think about, I mean, every, again, this could go to temperament too, because some people are, based on their temperament, more emotional, right? So, they actually feel things first, and then the the thoughts and awareness, right, that rational mind kicks in afterwards. Other people are more rational, right? So it's like you can compartmentalize your feelings in a way. So a lot of it does have to do with nature, but 
uh, you know, again, uh, that little blurb that I put in there is explaining that, in fact, for according to the research that we do actually feel first and I mean I'm trying to think of a, a good example of how this could apply um, fight or flight yeah that, yeah that's a good point yeah fight or flight is definitely one um, yeah in a panic situation right when you are especially scared you're fearful like terror, like any type of a crisis, people don't usually remember what to do, right? You almost lose rational thinking. This is why, you know, you'll see, um, again, like in those crisis situations, there's few people who can kind of step up and know what to do, but they, they're usually trained, right? It's like they have some military background, some background where they went through a training to know how to respond in those situations. I know for myself, I consider myself pretty rational, but I absolutely freeze when there's like a crisis. I don't, I, I like lose, I don't know what to do. And I, it's like, I'm trying to, you know, think about like how to fix it in the moment, but I know I'm quite dangerous, especially God forbid, like around water, because I don't know how to swim. So I think if anybody ever, don't ever go anywhere swimming with me, because I can't help you. I, I'll just like, I, can't, I don't know what to do, because if I jump in now, we're both gonna die, right? So I think there's certain scenarios that, um, that again, push us to that point where we feel Intense emotions, but our mind doesn't quite kick in, and yeah, so, things. Uh, yeah, the fight or flight is, is is a perfect so, example. So a mass casualty event, like mm -hmm. paramedics who yeah. hit an event, some of them never recover. So wow. And some of them have to do triage, so they're trained. Wow. That's oh, because they can't see the human suffering. So, my good. brother's a ER doctor, so my brother-in-law, so he had to be trained. Right. That's amazing. Too. Some people in med school can't do it. It has to be internal for surgeons because they can't do that. Yeah, it's too much. I mean, it's, there's some people, yeah, that have very you know, visceral response to those types of intense states. Or I know people who, um, like in a conflict situation, for example, like road rage, right? There's some people with road rage, they're very reactive, right? So they're reactive and they can honk and you know, they'll do it all. You see these two cars speeding alongside each other, fighting between, and you know, on the road. And then there's other people who just don't, they can't, they get, they literally will freeze up because the fear of that honking sound, you know, got them, and they're not even realizing what, what just happened, and they'll like be so confused or disoriented, right? So a lot of it does have to do with the way that, um, you know, our temperaments are and how we process whether reactive or not but I think uh, generally speaking that fight or flight um, example is a really good explanation of how kind of can be yeah. yes in terms of self-regulation mm -hmm. how do you explain addiction at a zombie perspective of overcoming it very good question mashallah um you know again Addictions are real, and we would definitely defer to you know, a more medical, um, psychological you know, explanation on how that forms, because some addictions can be def you know, her hereditary as far as um, you know, certain, um, for example, I, mean, I, I remember reading with, with drug addiction or even alcohol, you know, alcoholism, it can run in the family, right? So you can have certain genetic predispositions to certain addictions, that also that all has to factor in. But if it comes to your own behavior, right, where you were doing something that without any regulation of yourself, then you are ultimately responsible for those choices. And from an Islamic perspective, you would need to, of course, tend to that and likely go into a program. And there are now programs for you know run by Muslims that will deal with different addictive behaviors. Um, to help people from a spiritual, physical, you know, psychological, and and even medical perspective on how they can address those addictions, but you know, uh, this comes usually because there's no regulation, right? If you're not um, accountable for yourself and you allow yourself to do certain things, you will fall into those types of behaviors because, again, the nafs and the police they work in concert with each other. So your nafs will tell you, you know, to continue doing whatever it is, whether again it's drugs, gambling, alcohol, it could be a myriad of things that people find uh, you know, to be addictive. 
Um, but then shaitan is you know, going to push you even further into that so that you uh, so that beca you become habituated to it. So the reversal of that is to, again, have, have to you know, take a multi-pronged, maybe, approach to fighting those urges. So may, there may be medical intervention, there may be therapy, cognitive you know, behavior therapy. There can be a, a different ways of approaching it based on what the addiction is. But um, you would be ultimately responsible for yourself in that scenario. I mean, and, and it's very real. I mean, these are, that's why, alhamdulillah, for you know, increased awareness, with especially when it comes to you know, mental health, um, there are a lot of people who may not know that you know, this is something that they may have, for example, through this position too, or you know, there's some other component there. So when you have a proper evaluation, proper experts, you know, helping you, I think it can really um, make things clear. So the brother was asking about recommendations to help with procrastination and just a general like lack of desire to, to to feel motivated. So it's a very good question. Procrastination is a huge problem, and that's why the hadith, when we study them and internalize their meanings, they can start to really make sense. One of the hadith that really helps me is the reminder that a person is not promised the night in the morning, nor are they promised the morning and the evening, right? So for me, that makes a lot of sense in that if I want to do something and I my mind tells me do it later, right, that I have to check myself and say, but later isn't guaranteed, right? Um, I don't even know. I mean, that's a pretty broad amount of time, but even the hour, the next hour is not guaranteed because people, you know, pass away instantly all the time without any explanation and this happens with youth it happens with children it, i mean it, and, and the reason why i think those things happen to me i want to protect us and may i want to protect our, all our loved ones is to humble us to say don't let you know this idea that you have you know uh, like one of the diseases of the heart is, is right that you have uh, like false hopes because false hope is a disease. Who told you that you are going to be able to do this, right? So, so prioritize the now, right? And the, and the believer lives in the now because the past is done, right? So we don't live in the past. Like, so that's why that we're taught like lo mina shaitan. If you, what if, I should have, why did I? These are the thoughts that people who are stuck in the past and in this depressive state are being bombarded with because they think that they could have done things differently. That's a shaitanic impulse because he just wants you to be stuck there. And then anxiety is about the future, right? So a lot of people are crippled by you know, fear of what's to come and they don't feel motivated to do anything. Whereas the believer realizes the now matters and I don't, I need to use every moment now because if I die in the state that I'm in now, where will I end up, right? And that hypervigilance about the now is a, a motivating factor. And then in terms of just general motivation, your sahba matters, you know, who we keep our company with. So if you don't have good company that reminds you to be better and that you can, like, you know, right, we're, we're a sahba kun, right? We're supposed to compete with one another. Um, so if we're not vying with one another in our friendships, um, then we may lose the, the drive. So you should have people that challenge you. Like if you have friends who you know are, for example, right now, you know, doing hips, and they're your age, they work full time like you, or they're doing, they're aspiring to something great. You should be like, why? What is it that they have that I don't have? Why? Can't, you know, they have a family, they have a job, they're doing stuff. Why am I not doing it? And uh, and start to. Push yourself to a higher standard instead of stagnation. Because stagnation is just like you're just coasting, right? But we are encouraged to always be better, right? To aspire for better. And look at your trajectory. If you're the same person you were last year and the year before and two, three years ago, that means your nuts is driving the car. Like your nuts is just cruise control, um, doesn't minimal effort, mediocre. And that shouldn't be good enough for you because we're not a mediocre people, right? We have the best of creation as our example, so we have to challenge ourselves. Is there another hand? I'm sorry, I thought I saw another hand. I'm 
Alhamdulillah. All right, Jazakumullah khair and thank you so much, everyone.